This week, it's follow the money. Tobacco control's self-fulfilling prophecy epitomized in Australia and a bunch of lackluster vape industry press releases. Ain't nothing to it, but to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending 5 August 2022. Last week, we witnessed Matt Holman ditch the FDA to go work for Philip Morris. Another example of the FDA official bolting to an industry that they just policed. And this isn't something new. A grid analysis of LinkedIn profile data suggests at least 2,700 ex-FDA employees now work for the pharmaceutical industry. And another 1,100 current FDA employees have moved the other way, from industry to the FDA. One of the best examples of this revolving door is former Trump FDA chief Scott Gottlieb on the board of directors for Pfizer just weeks after he left a government agency, as well as the current FDA commissioner, Robert Califf, who went from heading FDA during the Obama administration to Alphabet Inc.'s health subsidiaries. And then moving back to the agency this past year. Dr. Google will see you now. Alphabet is spending billions to become a force in healthcare. Can it finally shake up the stodgy multi-trillion dollar industry? Anyway, it's not just government agencies that see a revolving door. This same behavior is very common for politicians, regardless of the country that you live in. One minute, they work for some consulting firm, and the next minute, they're running for office with election coffers filled by the very same companies that they just worked for. Yet come election time, we never hear about these corporate ties. Where's the journalism exposing these ties? Where's the journalism exposing how government officials are influenced by their funding? Well, today, you're going to find out with just one hour of research can find about the FDA and why vaping is getting such a bad rap. The first rule of journalism is follow the money. So where does the FDA CTP get their money to operate? You would think that, you know, it's some allocation of the federal budget, but that is not the case. 100% of the FDA CTP's tobacco budget comes from user fees. 0% comes from the federal budget. According to this chart, that's $682 million. The FDA 2021 annual budget was $6.1 billion. 11.3% goes to tobacco control and oversight. Wait a minute. 11.3% of 6.1 billion is $689,300,000. That's $7 million discrepancy. But you know what? It gets even weirder when you realize 100% of FDA's tobacco budget comes from user fees. You see, 21 U.S. Code 387S specifies for fiscal year 2019 and each subsequent fiscal year, the FDA must collect $712 million in user fees. You don't need an accounting degree to figure out someone still owes the FDA at least $23 million. Or is it $30 million? Either way, that is still not enough money for the FDA. And why for fiscal year 2023, the FDA has some 
legislative proposals that it wants Congress to enact. Like the Modernization of Tobacco User Fees Framework, Section 919 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act authorizes FDA to assess and collect tobacco user fees from domestic manufacturers and importers of six classes of products. Cigars, pipe tobacco, cigarettes, snuff, chewing tobacco, and roll-your-own tobacco. But ends which are currently the most illegally used tobacco product category by youth, is not on the list. So FDA wants more money to control illegal activity? Another $100 million to be exact, please. I mean, they did just issue marketing denial orders for oh, 6.8 million end products and only authorized three companies to sell the remaining 21 products. So now these three companies need to split and cough up the $100 million so the FDA can keep issuing marketing denial orders for the synthetic nicotine, 1 million applications and fight the imminent lawsuits that are surely going to follow. Oh, and instead of collecting a fixed amount, which would now total $812 million a year, well, the FDA wants tobacco user fees to now be indexed with inflation. Is it me? Or does the math just not add up here? So let's take a look at the United States Government Accountability Office when they evaluated tobacco product regulation way back in 2014. As of March 31st, 2014, the Food and Drug Administration has spent about $1.48 billion, that's 79%, of the $1.88 billion in total tobacco user fees it collected since the fiscal year of 2009. FDA spent the majority of tobacco user fees on key activities led by the agency's Center for Tobacco Products, which is funded solely by tobacco user fees. The math still doesn't add up here. So let's take a step back and take a look at the entire FDA funding history and the fiscal year 2020 appropriations in billions of dollars. Here's a nice graph of the FDA's budget authority as well as its growing dependence on user fees. From 1992 until today, it is quite obvious how important user fees are and any logical thinking person would start questioning how all these corporate dollars from prescription drug, medical device, animal drug, food manufacturers, bioscience, and tobacco companies influence the products FDA deems appropriate for the protection of public health. The FDA's budget for fiscal year 2021 was six. $0.1 billion. 54% or $3.3 billion came from the government's budget. And 46% or $2.8 billion came from the industries that they're supposed to regulate. And this year, they're asking for $8.4 billion. How much money does one government agency need to say this product is safe or this product is not safe? And let's not forget the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. For fiscal year 2021, the requested budget for tobacco was $663 million. But legally, they are required 
to collect user fee income of $712 million. Where's the rest of this money going at the FDA? And why hasn't anyone else out there ever bothered to ask this question? Does the FDA work for the people? Or does the FDA work for the corporations making all these user fee payments? At what point can we no longer trust the FDA? FDA oversees over 100,000 tobacco products, not including ENDS products, of which they just denied 6.8 million PMTAs and only authorized three companies and 21 ENDS products. Are those 21 product sale volumes going to be able to pay a hundred million dollars in user fees? With the exception of the Enjoy Ace, every single product that they approved sucks horribly. And I predict won't be on the market in a few years, despite being the only products authorized by the FDA. Is Enjoy, is Enjoy going to be able to pay $100 million in user fees to monopolistically stay in the game? Wait a minute. Technically, they haven't changed the law yet. Congress hasn't applied user fees to end because Senate Bill 2445 was just introduced last month. Compliments of Ms. Shaheen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Collins, Ms. Baldwin, and Mr. Romney. We have the resources to prevent Youth Vaping Act. An act that has nothing to do with prevention, has nothing to do with youth vaping, and only cares about capping the user fees on the inevitable products to replace cigarette combustion. So let's take a closer look at the 365-year-old Senate group hypocritically proposing the resources to prevent illegal youth vaping act. Janine Shaheen, 75, Democratic Senator from New Hampshire, in politics since 1990 and roosting in federal office since 2015. Janine Shaheen has a net worth in 2018 of $3.8 million. But in 2016, had a net worth of $10.6 million. This is followed by Dick Durbin at the ripe old age of 77, Democratic Senator and Party Whip since 2005, in politics since the beginning of the true internet. Yes, folks, that is 1983 when ARPANET migrated to TCP IP and created the true internet. Dick Durbin has been in political office as long as the internet has been in existence. Let that sink in for a moment. And let me ask you, where were you in 1983? By the way, Dick Durbin has a net worth in 2016 of $1.94 million. Also artificially masturbating this legislation into existence is Susan Collins, 69. She's been a Republican senator since 1993, but actively in politics since 1975 when she was an assistant, a staff assistant, for Senator Cohen. Ah, uh, who can forget 1975? 1975, when the federal rules of evidence 
were approved by the U.S. Congress. Mitchell, Haldman, and Ehrlichman were found guilty of the Watergate cover-up. You remember the Watergate cover-up? Gerald Ford appointed Nelson Rockefeller to investigate uh, domestic abuses of the CIA. This stuff doesn't ring a bell? It was before your time? Okay, okay. How about the Vietnam War? How about the year Australian television switches to full-time color broadcast? Still not ringing a bell? All right, all right, all right, all right. 1975 was the year Queen released their single, Bohemian Rhapsody. I'd play a snippet of the song for you to make sure you get it, but I'm not willing to take a copyright strike, so you have to Google it, search. You're not going to have to Google it. Everybody knows Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, I forgot to mention, her net worth is $8 million. Next up, we have Tammy Baldwin, a 60-year-old Democratic senator from Wisconsin since 2013. But she started out with city politics back in 1985. And Tammy only has a net worth of $1.1 million in 2018. And last, but certainly not least, we have before us Willard Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney, a 75-year-old junior Utah senator since 2019, has amassed a net worth of $174.5 million. He was the governor of Massachusetts from 2003 to 2007, just so that he could enact Romney care. And he ran for president in 2008, losing the nomination to John McCain. And tried again in 2012, losing to President Obama. But listen here, folks, that is not what we know him for. Mitt Romney made millions off of cigarette smoking, but now wants to kill its competition. Yeah, we remember Michelle Minton's article from January 2020 when Romney introduced the Ending New Nicotine Dependencies Act, essentially banning all open systems, all flavors other than tobacco flavor, and any non-medical vaping device. But that's not all. Let's not forget Mitt Romney's Bain Capital made millions on big tobacco in U.S. and Russia. In March 1993, Right about the time Susan Collins became a senator, the American government gave Bain and Company a $3.9 million contract to advise Boris Yeltsin's administration on the privatization of the Russian economy. According to records detailed detailing the arrangement and covered by the Huffington Post, Romney's consultants helped foreign firms and aspiring oligarchs decide how to corral Russia's riches, including writing an official manual that outlined how to best navigate the process. At the same time, Bain leveraged its contacts with senior Russian officials to arrange sweetheart deals for its tobacco clients. This blood money U.S. contract resulted in tripling the number of Russians smoking. 
Can you believe that? It only took $3.9 million to triple the number of Russians smoking. In 1992, only 7% of Russian women smoked. By 2009, that rose to nearly 22%. The same survey found that smoking rates among Russian men, already high before communism's fall, have also risen since Bain's tobacco exploits of the early 90s, with 60% now smoking cigarettes. Nearly 44 million smoke in Russia, a country of 142 million people. Dmitry Yanin the head of consumer protection, non-governmental organization in Moscow, said there are 400,000 smoking-related deaths each year in Russia, making it the same smoking death rate as the United States, with a population more than twice as big. Mitt Romney single-handedly killed more Americans and Russians then died in World War II. For the record, that is 24,418,500 lives. Just think about that. 800,000 Americans and Russians die from smoking every single year. And Mitt Romney has been working at this revolving door project for over 30 years. There's no question Mitt Romney made big money from big tobacco. Bain's advocacy amounted to an early example of corporate astroturf tactics that are now commonplace. In the same corporate affairs document under mobilizations, Bain consultants encourage the company to conduct federal and local grassroots programs in support of the company's legislative and regulatory efforts. We vaping advocates wonder why it is so hard to get people to believe our life experiences and join our advocacy for the single best way to quit smoking. Well, here's why. They've been doing this astroturf techniques for so long. Mitt Romney and the rest of the folks of Bain Capital poisoned the grassroots pool. And now Mitt Romney is instituting the regulatory moves needed to ensure that only corporate entities get to rule the roost. Mormon Mitt is definitely in bed with big tobacco interests. Mitt Romney's religious hypocrisy and lack of moral scruples are most tellingly exemplified by his personal involvement in Bain Capital's work for Big Tobacco, which included hooking millions of Russians on the drug that is anathema to Mormons. I already covered this before. Even worse, Mitt repeats the same lies over and over and over, even after they've been debunked. He appears completely unconcerned about being caught. That's the new level of mendacity we see in politics today. MSNBC's Steve Bennon observed, Romney gets away with it because he and his team realize that contemporary political journalism just isn't equipped to deal with a candidate who lies this much about so many topics so often. Does that remind you of anybody? And now this mockery of a travesty of a mockery of a sham. Sorry, folks. I know most of you have no clue about the courtroom scene in Woody Allen's movie, Bananas. Mitt Romney was 24 when that movie came out in 1971. This 75-year-old big tobacco shill adjoins with his 281-year-old political mates 
to end ends and then collect a fixed user fee from whoever survives the regulatory process. I'm sorry, but this is the biggest mockery of proportionate regulation since Julius Caesar declared himself dictator of Rome. No wonder they titled it the Resources to Prevent Youth Vaping Act. It has nothing to do with prevention. It has nothing to do with youth vaping and only cares about capping user fees on the inevitable products to replace cigarette combustion. And my point is, follow the money. Come election time, everyone's only talking about who's going to be the next president. But it's your senators and your representatives who write the laws, not the president. If you want real change, you must change who's representing you at government. It's not about party affiliation when the person in office is making laws that hurt you and hurt public health for profit. Sorry, folks. Didn't mean to get in such a passionate rant. But people are dying every single day. And there's a simple solution that's out there, but they won't let it stay out there. All right, I'm going to go have another coffee. Calm down, have a vape. And how about we dive down under to the land down under and see another big tobacco playbook that's exposed. But this is a tobacco playbook I wish would have been carried through to fruition. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Proposed program that would see Philip Morris pay pharmacists $275 when they order Vive Vapes labeled nothing short of appalling. A controversial program that would have led pharmacists receiving $275 from Philip Morris when they order its V vapes has been paused amid growing concern about the ethics of the tobacco giant incentivizing the sale and promotion of its harm reduction products. The scheme first reported by News Corp would have seen pharmacists receive $5 every time they dispense a new Vive script. $10 for educating a new patient about the device and $5 for referring patients to a doctor to obtain a necessary prescription. Pharmacists would also receive a $275 payment for placing the initial stock order. Following a backlash from doctors and health experts, ironically, the IT platform responsible for rolling out the scheme, Pharma Programs, that the launch had been paused. It's amazing how adding harm reduction into the context of that statement completely changes the impact of this scare story. Anyway, continuing on, Big Tobacco's attempt at financial kickbacks shows absolute contempt for pharmacists, contempt for their integrity, contempt for pharmacists' professional and ethical obligation to put the health and well-being of their patients first. Multinational tobacco companies have no place in health care. Well, I'm sorry, folks, but that sentence would not play well in the United States, where consumers are inundated daily, if not hourly, with paid TV advertisements asking patients to tell their doctors what pills they should be taking. 
where pharmacies encourage patients to use specific alternatives to what their doctors prescribes, and where posters for pharmaceutical products line the walls of waiting rooms and billboards all across the country. It's all about profit, baby, and why they pay so much in user fees to the FDA. Cancer isn't an illness to be cured. It's a cash cow for the healthcare industry and all of their friends. If big tobacco were to eliminate all the healthcare costs of their products, think of all the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, lobbyists, and FDA employees that would all be laid off. Think of the global recession if healthcare was Oh, I don't know. Actually about getting people healthy? Oh, my. Oops. I forgot the biggest group, the biggest group that would lose their jobs. Public health and body part organizations. Oh, we got to think about them, too. Think of all the NGO messaging groups who would no longer have a purpose. Think of the hypocrite American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network. Think of the campaign for tobacco free kids. Think of the coalition to end tobacco targeting. Coalition to End Tobacco Targeting calls on City to end sale of flavored tobacco products. Congressman Joyce Beatty joined the Coalition to End Tobacco Targeting Thursday to ask city government to pass legislation that would end the sale of menthol cigarettes and all flavored tobacco products in Columbus. The Coalition advocates for legislation that would ban flavored e-cigarettes and menthol products that have historically targeted the black community, said the coalition. Listen, folks, just before I quit smoking, I smoked menthol cigarettes, up to three packs per day. It is not just something targeted to the black community. And flavored vaping products are the single best way to end the real cause of death and disease. And that is smoking combustible cigarettes. Plain cigarettes are no better than menthol cigarettes. And low nicotine cigarettes are even worse. If you want to improve the health outcome of the black community, of any community, you need to have flavors. Flavors move people from high-risk products like cigarettes to low-risk products like vaping. You know what? Actually, Matt said it better, so... Flavors are also what get adult smokers to switch from the most toxic product, combusted cigarettes, to a less toxic product. We want to allow an off-ramp uh, for current combusted cigarette smokers. And I think, you know, having flavored products out there um, may be necessary to do that. E-liquids are all synthetic. So technically all e-liquids are flavored. I mean, even tobacco flavored e-liquids are flavored. You know, I think from a public health perspective, we do I think need flavored products out there to see um, that shift down the continuum of risk of combusted cigarette smokers to these less toxic products. I don't think it's just the flavors that appeal to youth. There is still this really um, strong barrier between certain stakeholder groups that I think ultimately, you know, my personal opinion, the, the consumers are the ones losing out because of that, um, particularly when it comes to the, the messaging that, that's being shared. Flavors are also what get adult smokers to switch from 
the most toxic product, combusted cigarettes, to a less toxic product. If you ban the flavors, you prevent smokers from improving their health outcomes. It's tobacco control's latest self-fulfilling prophecy epitomized. If you want to make something irresistible to teenagers, portray it as the forbidden fruit. That is what has happened in the United States with electronic cigarettes. As I and others have documented, youth experimentation with nicotine vapor products was relatively rare until anti-tobacco advocates and the news media launched a publicity offense about the youth vaping epidemic. Predictably, as more teens believed all their friends were vaping, more became curious about this thing their parents, teachers, and other authority figures seemed so worried about. If we don't want the same thing to happen with heated tobacco products, journalists, activists, and health authorities must use extreme caution to avoid starting yet another unwarranted and likely to backfire moral panic. Except in Australia, it isn't just a moral panic. It's all the things that tobacco control advocate for that now the black market has been happy to supply and provide to the consumers that obviously still want these things. More than $500,000 worth of vapes seized amid major crackdown on illegal e-cigarettes. Thousands of illegal vapes have been seized as health experts worry a new generation is becoming addicted to nicotine. More than 15,000 electronic cigarettes valued at more than $500,000 were confiscated from 32 retailers during the six-week Western Australia health crackdown. People importing these products and selling them are trying to avoid detection by not having them labeled as containing nicotine. When you buy a vape, you don't know what's in the vape. Well, of course you don't. Of course you don't know what's in the vape anymore. That is exactly because Australian laws are so restrictive. And the punishment is so severe, it's all moved to the black market. Where there is no product regulation. And they sell whatever they can get their hands on regardless of what's in there or isn't in it. If the consumer industry wants something, well, the consumers are gonna go out, seek it, and find it. And if a business wants to make money, it's going to stock what their customers want. Just because you make something illegal does not mean that the product is magically just going to disappear. Cocaine is illegal. Yet Australian federal police arrest nine people across three jurisdictions in alleged cocaine syndicate bust. Cargo ship captain charged after 320 kilograms of cocaine seized in drug bust off Western Australian coast. How's that drug war going? Has making cocaine illegal stopped people from using it? Has it stopped people from smuggling it? Or has it simply grown another new syndicate to satisfy consumer demand? And tobacco is no different. The Australian Border Force has detected a significant increase in attempted illicit tobacco imports at the Australian border, according to Border Security Report. The Australian Border Force discovered 878.8 tons. Yeah, you heard that right. 878 tons of undeclared loose leaf tobacco and 712.7 .7 million undeclared cigarette sticks between 1 January and 31 December 2021. This is a 45% increase compared to 2020. Organized crime groups 
capitalize on unwitting smokers looking for cheap cigarettes to enrich themselves and to fund other types of criminal activities that harm our community. Sid Gred Linsdell, commander of the Australian Border Force Special Investigations Division. The Australian Border Force is working tirelessly to stop this activity, both at our border and within the Australia. Through comprehensive and powerful ITTF investigative actions. You think making vaping products illegal is, oh, I don't know, going to follow a completely unique, different path than what we've seen with everything else they make illegal? Or is it going to follow the exact same predictable outcome? Simply increasing criminal activity. And now funneling money into the pockets of the criminals and the syndicates and their organizations. Last time I checked, criminals don't pay any taxes on the products that they illegally sell, nor do they bother to check age of their customers. Speaking of which... It's been a while since I checked to see if vape shops are being burglarized to illegally resupply criminals that are illegally selling to kids to in custody for breaking into Sedalia Smoke Shop twice in three days. Sedalia police took two juveniles into custody after they allegedly broke into the Sedalia Smoke Shop twice in three days. Someone had broken into the store, stealing $3,000 worth of product and doing $330 in damage to the store. Crooks steal $20,000 in tobacco vape products from New York City 7-Eleven, cops say. Two crooks snatched up more than $20,000 in tobacco and vape products during an overnight heist at the Chelsea 7-Eleven store, authorities said. The duo broke the glass front door of the convenience store on 7th Avenue near West 21st Street around 4.30 a.m. July 21. Police said late Monday as they released surveillance footage of the pair. They went behind the cash register and swiped multiple tobacco products, cartons of cigarettes, and vapes totaling $20,230, cops said. The bandits took off after the robbery, escaping into the nearby train station at West 23rd Street and 7th Avenue, police said. You stop stores targeted in vape thefts. Lincoln police are investigating two cases of shoplifting where the targeted items were vape cartridges. Officers were called to the U stop at 942 South 27th Street at 9.30 a.m. Tuesday morning. The overnight employee reported at 2 a.m. Two men had entered the store. One held the door open and the other man took a display case containing vape cartridges. The total loss is estimated at $950. The number of cartridges taken is not known. Around 4.30 a.m. Wednesday morning, two men entered a U-stop at 3244 Kornharsker. One man asked for ice and the other man took an entire vape display that contained 90 cartridges. The estimated loss is $700. Lincoln police are investigating to see if the two cases are related. Anyone with information is asked to contact LPD. Warminster, PA. Warminster Township Police are investigating an overnight burglary at the Level Vape Shop. On July 20th, 2022, the suspect was caught on camera arriving on a mountain bike and forcing entry through the front glass door. He then took various store merchandise before leaving. Five-minute vape shop ram raid leaves owner down more than $20,000 in product. It took about five minutes for the Hamilton businessman to lose at least $20,000 in product in an early morning ram raid. A blue Mazda de Mio was driven into the glass front at vape to go on Victoria Street about 1.40 a.m. on Monday. CCTV footage shows the car nudging the window before reversing into the footpath. Three well-covered-up people then got out and ran through the storefront. Owner Tim Lee said they were very fast 
and knew what to take. They have taken the best sellers. Everything is gone. All devices, all the expensive ones have gone. Honestly, folks, I could easily go on and on reporting on just the burglaries this past week on vape shops, tobacconists, and convenience stores. But the facts remain. It wasn't like this a year ago. And it certainly wasn't like this a couple years ago when there were twice as many vape shops in the United States. The more you tax and the more you prohibit these products, the more criminal activity will result. Hey, stupid. It's the taxes and prohibition that drives the economic motivations for criminals. If these products were widely available, and if these products were cheap enough, there would be no reason for a crook to break into a vape shop. Who would buy their products if everyone who wanted one could easily get it at an affordable price? <sighs> well, since I've thoroughly beat a dead horse this week, how about we move on to some industry news and wrap this news segment up for the week? Vapor Empire launches the V-Nix Vape Pen. From Sydney, Australia, Vapor Empire has officially released the V-Nix Series Vape Pen, which is now available from the company's online store. With this new compact and reusable vaping device from Vapor Empire, vapers can take control of their vapor production by adjusting the device's airflow and wattage to match their e-liquid and vapor preference. The Venix provides vapors with a high level of control that allows them to make quick adjustments aimed at achieving optimal performance with a wide variety of e-liquids. We believe these features provide vapors with a better overall vaping experience and help accommodate a wider range of vaping styles, said Jimmy Jones, Vapor Empire's head of global operations. Phoenix Vapes comes with a refillable tank that allows vapors to fill and refill their tank with the e-liquid of their choosing. The tank's dual coil atomizers designed to be user replaceable and replacement atomizers are available for purchase from Vapor Empire's online store. The coils, which have a resistance range of 1.2 ohms to 1.5 ohms, are made from stainless steel and employ wicks made from 100% Japanese organic cotton. The device is powered by a rechargeable battery with a variable wattage range of 10.5 to 13.5 watts. That fully recharges in approximately one hour. Mesh coil is the future. A higher level vape brand proposition launched by Upends. Technological breakthrough makes the mesh coil of Upends more competitive. Upends has carried out dozens of technological innovations on mesh coil and planned on obtain more than 100 patents to Dr. Wu, the chief product officer of Upends. Structurally, we have carried out hundreds of thermal field experiments and simulations to match the best airflow design so that the atomizing core generates even heat perfectly to restore the original taste of e-liquids. Restore the original taste of e-liquids? What? How about they just atomize the liquid without needing to restore anything? Sorry, folks. I don't write these press releases. I just report whatever I can find. Last one. We have patent issued for smoking cessation device. U.S. Patent Office number 11388933. Smoke Watchers SAS. From the background information supplied by the inventors, news correspondents obtained the following quote. Cigarette smoke contains over 4,800 chemicals, 69 of which are linked to causing cancer. Smoking cigarettes can lower life expectancy by 13.2 years for men and 14.5 years for women. In the United States, cigarette smoking causes over 440,000 deaths per year. According to the American Lung Association, smoking is one of the most prevalent sources of preventable death worldwide. Quitting smoking and vaping 
is notoriously difficult. It is estimated that 52% of smokers try to quit smoking. However, 90% of smokers that attempt to quit smoking relapse. Many aids have been developed to quit smoking that are less harmful than cigarettes. For example, nicotine patches and nicotine gum have proven helpful in quitting smoking. Additionally, electronic cigarettes have been developed as an aid to quit smoking by providing a less harmful source of inhaled nicotine. Instead of burning nicotine and other chemicals like conventional cigarettes, electronic cigarettes vaporize a mixture of nicotine and volatile chemicals. This nicotine-rich vapor may be inhaled from the electronic cigarette. The vapor does not contain many of the harmful carcinogens that are contained in conventional cigarettes. However, despite these aids, the failure rate of smokers trying to quit smoking is remarkably high, while the death toll is ever increasing. Thus, a profound need exists to implement an improved method to help smokers quit smoking. So what's their patented quit smoking solution? It's a Bluetooth connection to track data regarding the usage of the vape. And then minimizing the nicotine withdrawal using program coaching via an app to achieve quit smoking goals. And then the app tapers the user off of their electronic cigarette using an app on your phone. Sorry, folks, but it sounds like where vape mods were headed before Google and Apple decided to remove the vaping apps from their platforms. All I can say is good luck getting your medical device through the FDA as a smoking cessation tool. It should only take you about Half a decade, now that you got your patent, assuming you have enough money to fund all the clinical research needed, or you bribe an FDA official with a lucrative job offer if they pass your smoking cessation device through the FDA's process. Oops. I guess I can't say that kind of comment or statement without a confirmed source. So here, let me print a little retraction right now because I don't have a source for that. I can't accuse the FDA of FDA employees of taking bribes to pass things without proof. Sorry. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending August 5th, 2022. I sincerely appreciate all of you who stuck through my rants this week. I sincerely hope that you have a fantastic weekend and a fantastic week to follow. And my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. Have a great day.